Thank you, Stacey, for that introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I hope that I'm going to come up with some uh, useful information regarding nutrition and MND. All right. So we know that maintaining an adequate nutritional intake is important in MND. And many studies have shown that um, main maintaining your weight and having good nutrition can actually improve prognosis as well as uh, improving quality of life. So in MND, many areas of the body are affected and some of the symptoms that you experience could reduce nutritional intake. So symptoms in the vulva area um, can result in dysphagia um, or swallow difficulty reduce jaw and tongue movements. So with the reduced jaw movement, it becomes a bit more difficult to, to chew. And the tongue movement means it's more difficult to move the food around the mouth as well. Um, if the MND is affecting the abdominal area, can result in feeling full before the end of the meal, uh, can reduce the appetite, as well as that um, slowing of the bowel can result in some constipation too. Um, if the lungs are infected by the MND, it's quite easy to become quite breathless when chewing uh, and eating and fatigue, easily fatigued as well whilst eating. And um, sometimes the arms and hands are affected. People will need assistance with eating and possibly to, for someone to provide them to give them the food or else to have adaptive cutlery and bowls and plates to help with uh, independent eating. Um, I've put the legs in there because uh, only the legs are affected and there's no other symptoms in the body. Um, a person will become less mobile. Um, so keep eating the same amount of food as they've normally eaten, but being less mobile means that uh, possibly weight gain could be too. So the opposite. Uh, so maybe the diet needs to be adapted there to be eating less. Um, if the emotions such as the person's feeling depressed or anxious as well, it can result in appetite loss. So all of these, all of these symptoms of MND can affect the nutrition uh, status of a person. So why do we want to avoid weight loss, and uh, what? So what are the effects of it? So this is I'm talking about unintentional weight loss. So here, uh, firstly, muscle breakdown can happen if we're not having enough uh, energy and protein. This results in reduced strength and uh, being more unsteady on the feet. So mobility is reduced too. And reducing uh, the respiratory muscle weakness, uh, muscles as well, and causing weakness there. So also reduced intake will impair immunity, meaning people are more susceptible to infections, which is what really we need to avoid. And there's also a higher risk of um, pressure sores developing or being uncomfortable when sitting because with losing weight means that some of the fat padding in our skin is lost. So there's a lot of pressure put on certain areas. So there are lots of effects of weight loss and uh, we're needing to avoid weight loss so we don't suffer these effects. So how, maintaining a good nutritional intake can be very challenging and the challenges um, can change as well as the disease progresses. Um, everyone's symptoms of MND are different. Um, so that's why I always recommend individualized dietitian support just to be able to tailor your diets to your individual needs and to see someone quite regularly as well. How do we prevent weight loss? Well, firstly, let's have a look at what the general, the Australian government recommends that everyone who is healthy should be eating. On the right hand side there, there's the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating. And you'll see there that there's a good third of it on the right hand side and it shows that we should be having a third of our daily intake as vegetables. A third of it is your starchy or carbohydrate foods. And then the last three groups at the bottom, protein, dairy and, veg and fruit, you need about a sixth of your daily intake to be those food groups. They're also recommending just using small amounts of the fats and margarines um, in the left hand corner and in the right hand corner they say only small amounts of the very high energy um, high fat foods. However, this may be suitable for someone with MND who doesn't have any of the symptoms which cause them to, weight, to lose weight. Like I was saying earlier, 
um, someone who probably maybe their legs are affected, they're less mobile, then we'd recommend healthy eating. However, if somebody is not managing to eat the normal amount of food that they used to eat and the portions are less as a result, we would say to steer away from this guide to healthy eating and move more towards a high protein, high energy diet. Okay, so we'd recommend this diet when somebody has already started losing weight, um, without trying that is, or who are at risk of losing weight. So possibly someone who swallow is starting to deteriorate or you know the food intake is reducing go on to a high protein high energy diet so the protein foods just quickly they are things like meat chicken fish eggs milk cheese yogurt beans nuts and all the vegetable proteins as well and we'd say try and have one of those foods at every meal when when eating a meal such as a main meal which has got your meat Got your carbohydrate and your vegetables we'd try and say have your protein first have your meat first followed by the carbohydrate and then if you are too full to finish the meal it's okay not to have had the vegetables and salad okay that way you're getting the most protein and energy into your your diet try to eat five to six small meals a day if you're not having three full-size meals and they on the high protein, high energy diet, would say avoid anything that's low fat. This goes against definitely what the general population guidance is. So go on to full fat milk, creamy yogurts, for example, and avoiding any diet or low calorie foods. So that's, that's an important change there as well. Another tip, if you're going to miss a meal because you just can't face food, you're not hungry, try having a drink which is nutritious would be a good way to try maintain your nutritional intake. So here we would say, have some iced coffee maybe, or a flavored milk, or Milo or hot chocolate. That way you'll be at least getting some nutrition and keeping your, your protein intake up, okay? Another thing you can do as well to prevent weight loss uh, with this is to take the food that you're gonna be eating for your meal and think about what else you can be adding to that food to try and fortify or enrich it. So I'm using it for example here, something like grated cheese, sour cream or cream, milk powder, adding seeds, nuts, honey, that sort of thing to your foods. By mixing, say for example, grated cheese, butter, milk powder into mashed potato, it doesn't increase the volume of the mash, but it really does make the potato that you're eating, very, very high energy and high fat. And that's the whole aim of this. So smaller portions, yes, but always think what can you add into that to enrich it? And that will help to stop weight loss as well. Okay. Um, now what I've done is, is taken a day's menu as an example to show how you can actually change from a normal everyday menu up to a higher protein, higher energy menu. Okay. So on the left hand side, uh, there's the breakfast, which is a slice of toast with spread and jam uh, and a cup of tea. How can we change that? Possibly change it to a creamy porridge. So porridge where it's made with full cream milk. So no water at all, just all milk. Add some syrup and cream to that um, and then follow that up with a milky coffee. So that milky coffee could be a full cup of milk, full cream milk um instead of made with water all right so you can see breakfast two is a lot higher in calories and protein and breakfast one similar thing in morning tea changing your normal coffee to milky coffee changing from plain biscuits to chocolate biscuits as well um a lunch so a healthy salad ham ham and salad sandwich there could be changed possibly to a fried omelet so you're adding oil to fry it using two eggs cheese and fried vegetables Following that up with a creamy yogurt instead of a low fat yogurt and drinking a fruit juice instead of water. That'll add quite a lot of calories, but it's not necessarily increasing the bulk or the volume that someone will need to eat. Uh, afternoon tea, tea and ginger biscuits. You could change that to strawberry milk and chocolate biscuits again. Um, and as an idea here, there's a lovely healthy meal on the left hand side of steak, boiled meat, rice and vegetables. If someone has a poor appetite, just don't, 
you know, not able to eat all of that, why not change to something like beef stroganoff, which has got a cream-based sauce, uh, it's got the beef, it's got the carbohydrates, but there's no vegetables in it. You know, vegetables are good for vitamins and minerals and fiber, but they don't give a lot of energy. So we want to use the space that you've got to fill up on protein and, and carbohydrate foods where possible. Don't get me wrong, if you have space for the vegetables, eat the vegetables, but use the eat them last. Um, ice block after dinner, why not have a chocolate ice cream after that instead? All right, and then the, the sixth meal or the small snack of the day would be something at night instead of a cup of tea, a drink, a milky drink as well. So you can see how by changing the food you're having and can really increase the protein and energy. Okay, now if you're finding that even by doing all those measures, by trying to eat a high protein, high energy diet, by fortifying your foods with butter, margarine, oil, cream, cheese, etc., your weight is still gradually coming down. Then I would try to say, well, maybe it's time to try and introduce a higher protein, high energy drink. Uh, there are a lot of supplements out there that you can buy from pharmacies. Um, I'm not saying any preference here, but uh, they're all generally quite high in energy and high in protein. Um, and they would be a very good between meal um, snack or drink to have. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to speak a bit more about the bulbar changes that can happen with MND. So valve changes is anything from the throat upwards, the throat down and up to the mouth. Um, and they generally occur when the nerves that carry messages to the muscles in your jaw, lips, throat or face and tongue are affected, which then causes the muscles to become weaker. So if the throat is affected, not everyone will have be affected in all of these areas. And it's very individual. Some may only be affected in one area, others in two or three, for example. So that's when the throat is affected, people experience a swallowing difficulty or dysphagia. When the jaw movement is slowing, that's when chewing becomes a bit more difficult. Um, when the tongue is, starts to slow down as well, maybe the effectiveness of moving food around in the mouth when chewing and also moving the food bolus to the back of the throat, throat and preparing to swallow is affected too. And the lips, sometimes being able, unable to maintain a lip seal can happen as well. So looking at dysphagia or swallowing difficulty first, the sign that, you, that someone is experiencing that is coughing or choking. Um, and that's a sign that those throat muscles and that the swallow is lacking coordination. So when this happens, there is that risk of food and drink moving, going into the lungs, basically going the wrong way instead of into the stomach, into the lungs. That's what we call aspiration and really what needs to be avoided because it can lead to chest infections. Unfortunately, with coughing and choking as well, understandably, it can lead to people being afraid to eat as well. So that's why it's so important to get the right texture of the food and thickness of drink by having a swallow assessment by a speech and language therapist. And they, rec they will recommend the safest texture of food and drink and thickness of drink to have so you won't aspirate. Now there are four food textures that will be, um, one of which will be recommended, so the normal texture of diets. A softer diet, so for example there, that would be more like um, slow cooked meats and, and well cooked vegetables, for example. A minced diet and a puree diet, which is just very um, blended, smooth food. And then the three fluid thicknesses, well thin is normal water thickness, going on to mildly thick fluid, moderately thick fluid and extra thick fluid. And here um, the speech therapist would advise on uh, what type of thickener to use. So thickener powder is normally used and added to drinks. Uh, they can be bought from they can be bought from pharmacies, and it's important they to follow the directions very carefully. It takes a little while to get used to thickened drinks, but the advantage there is that you would have no, less risk of being of aspirating on the drinks. Okay. 
So changing the texture of foods, this, this can happen in this advice and a dysphagia. Now I'd always follow what the speech language therapist has to say, but um, if you haven't seen the speech language therapist, the first thing you could try is to avoid mixed texture foods. So these are foods which contain two textures. For example, there would be soup, which is a, a liquid, runny, thin um, liquid, and vegetable or chicken pieces. If someone has a swallow which is affected, uh, they have dysphagia, it's quite hard to be able to manage two textures of food at the same time. Okay. Um, you may also need to change um, texture of foods, not just due to dysphagia, but also because chewing has become more difficult. Needing softer foods, um, or that it's harder to move food around the mouth. So you want food to be more cohesive, to stick together. So it's easier for the tongue to move it to the back of the throat to, to swallow. So I would try to avoid foods that need a lot of chewing such as uh, bread. Bread can be quite sticky in the mouth and hard to move around. Certain meats like steak can be quite chewy as well. Uh, foods such as vegetable skins, they can be difficult. They can get caught uh, between the teeth and the cheek. They're quite difficult to clear. Sometimes they can be stuck in the throat as well. And hard foods such as toast, pastry, biscuits, um, they do tend to crumble and small bits can get caught in the throat. So that's just some first initial advice and um, that the speech language therapist will be able to give a lot more information about that. Now, there are two websites I'd like to recommend there at the bottom of the page there. The first one's what we call the nutrition um, or the NEMO website, that's nutrition education. Um, I can't remember the name, sorry, but if you look at the Google NEMO, uh, and the second one um, for good recipes when it comes to modified texture foods, that's also in the Nemo website. Um, and you can find some, some good recipes and ideas there. Now, when the mouth area is affected and um, the tongue possibly isn't working as well, food particles can stay in the mouth for longer. Um, as well as that, if saliva is a bit drier, or you're losing uh, saliva, it does mean that um, the anti-infective properties of that saliva um, is not is reduced. So there is that increased risk of candida overgrowth and also mouth sores. So here we would always recommend good oral hygiene. So brushing teeth after your meals, um, using oral swabs. So that picture on the right hand side just shows the swab where it's a sponge at the end of a stick and normally that sponge has got some bicarb in it so if you dip it in water and just clean your mouth with that uh, it does help to have good mouth hygiene but also just check your mouth uh, daily as well for any signs of um, poor oral hygiene as well okay now nausea is something which can be caused in people in mnd um, sometimes from the diet and sometimes from other reasons and it can really really impact on nutritional intake so it's well worth trying to find a solution to overcome the nausea. So the, um, it's beyond the scope of me to speak about uh, the causes of nausea which are non-diets but I will speak about the ones that could be diet related. So firstly um, if someone is swallowing A whilst eating it could be due to uh, the swallow being affected and eating the incorrect texture of food, the thickness of food, resulting in gulping of the food or the drink down and at the same time swallowing A. So that's where going to a speech and language therapist and getting a swallow assessment will uh, definitely be the way to go there. Hunger can bring on nausea as well. So if you're having difficulty and uh, not eating enough for various reasons we've just discussed before, try get onto the high protein, high energy diet. Try modified textures if needs be, and the supplement drinks can help too. So if you're not sure if you need the modified texture diet, go back to the speech and language therapist, visit the dietitian to see what else you can do to, to just get your nutritional intake up there. Dehydration can bring on nausea as well. So that's making sure again that you have the right thickness of fluid. 
And if it's fine, if you're finding it hard to drink enough, even with the right thickness, having food which have got a high moisture content, so things like um, thickened soups, a yogurt, custard, jelly, they've all got a lot of moisture in them as well. So you're getting some nutrition, but you're also getting the fluid. So I'd recommend that. Uh, foot constipation there too, because that can, uh, if it's quite severe, the food can back up a lot and then loss of appetite and nausea can occur. So managing constipation well, which is what we'll talk about next, is another cause, another um, way. Possibly you could reduce nausea. Now, some people may experience some acid reflux. So there is medication for this, and I'd visit the GP to see if there's something you could have for, for acid reflux, which is very uncomfortable. In terms of diet, first line measures you could take there would be to make sure you don't drink when you're um, eating. So try and drink only half an hour before or half an hour after eating. So it means the stomach contents aren't too liquid and likely to come up when you eat. Um, secondly, try not to lie down after eating. So probably wait about an hour before you lie down. And sometimes things like alcohol and caffeine, caffeinated drinks like tea, coffee, energy drinks can also cause some acid reflux as well. But if none of those measures are, are helping and you still have nausea, then it's definitely worthwhile going to the GP, see if there is a, a cause, a medication which is causing the nausea and um, possibly high carbon dioxide levels. So trying to manage that as well would help but also managing stress and anxiety levels as well, because that can lead to loss of appetite and nausea. So when it comes to diet and nausea, there are certain foods which are better tolerated than others. So it's just a few tips here. Some people will find that the very fatty, rich or hot foods or very sweet foods can make nausea worse. So we're trying to stay, steer clear of those Move towards the bland tasting foods, so plain fish and meat, boiled potato. But don't be afraid to add a bit of extra fat there if you try to eat the high protein, high energy diet. Um, avoid foods which are very hot. They rather go for cold or room temperature foods. Um, some people will find that salty foods help. So things like some crisps or soup, which is a bit salty. Um, drinking cold drinks. Um, I have put cold water there, yes, it is a good form of um, hydration, but it doesn't give nutrition. So I try to say steer more towards cold milk. That's a good high protein drink. Otherwise, ginger ale, fruit juices, or peppermint flavored tea may help too. So try, if you can't manage big meals, you start eating and feel nauseous, try and make sure you eat every, every hour or two with small frequent snacks uh, through the day. Sitting upright after eating, yes, that will help. Um, rinsing your mouth or brushing your teeth after eating, that gets rid of the thirst. That the flavor of the food in the mouth, that could help. And also staying away from the kitchen. Sometimes the smell of food cooking can cause people to be quite nauseous. Okay, so moving on to constipation here. The definition of constipation, I had to, had to look this up, was um, three or less bowel movements per week. Um, so we would try and say, try and have a bowel movement at least once every two days or every one to two days if possible. And the reasons why constipation is, um, is more likely to occur in MND is that there could be changes to the diet. So maybe a person starts eating less fiber and fluid. We'd recommend to somebody, oh, eat lots of fruit and vegetables, get your fiber in, but not an MND because this could then really compromise the high protein, high energy diet. Uh, re reduced mobility uh, as well as a cause. Sometimes the bowel movements can slowly reduce. If there's some weakness of the pelvic floor or the abdominal muscles, that could be a cause. And of course, certain medications such as the opioids or pain relief could be a cause as well. So we know what the symptoms are. Um, nausea, bloating, reduced appetite, discomfort and pain, and sometimes overflow diarrhea as well. So before we go on to the management of constipation, 
it's important to um, make sure we know a bit more about how the bowel works. So on the left hand side there we've got a picture of the large intestine um, and the right hand side is the Bristol stool chart which documents the different types of stools from type 1 being very constipated to type 7 which is more like diarrhea. So in a normal well functioning bowel would find that the large intestine would, sorry, liquid feces would enter the large intestine and, and slowly move along. And whilst it's moving along, water will be drawn out of that liquid feces, so it becomes more solid. If it's a good high fibre stool and the bowel is working well, then the person would have a stool which is more like type 4. However, when the bowel starts to slow down, it, the feces will move a lot slower through the large intestine, meaning that more and more fluid is absorbed through it from it, resulting in quite a hard stool, maybe type 1 or a type 2 stool. There are bacteria in the bowel, the large intestine, which ferment. There is food found in the feces and that releases gas. So the longer the stool is in the bowel, the more gas is produced and that then results in bloating as well. So moving on to how we manage this, I'll just go into the next page. Um, it's important to make sure we have enough to drink, have enough fluid. So between two to three liters of, of drink per day, um, rather than having fruit and vegetables as I was saying before, try and have a fiber supplement. Something like psyllium husk, is a powder that can be mixed into drinks. So mixed into a milk drink, mixed into your porridge in the morning if you like. Some people find that pears or prune juice or fresh pear or fresh prunes also help move the bowels, the high sorbitol fruit, to have them daily. Now if those first three measures aren't working, I think it's then time to move to your GP or pharmacist and speak about laxatives. Now there are, um, three levels of laxatives if you like. We generally start with stool softeners. That's not working. We may need something that will stimulate the bowels. And as a last resort, there are suppositories and enemas as well. And as I said before, the soft stool, sort of around about the type four on the Bristol stool chart, every one to two days is the aim. So I, I would like to speak a bit about pegs today as well. Uh, and the official name for them is a percutaneous endoscopic gastroscopy, but basically it's a tube which runs from the stomach to the abdomen. Um, and it's a very soft, I don't know if you can see that well, but it's a very soft, flexible tube from this section down that goes into the stomach and all that's left, sorry, is that. So you have the feeding ports on the right hand side you have a clip here in the middle and then you'd have a bumper on this side just to hold the tube in position. Okay, now uh, what a peg tube does is it allows any liquid feed, fluid or medication to go directly into the stomach and bypasses the throat. So the advantage is there if someone has dysphagia then there's no need to swallow those things down. But also it has other benefits as well for people who possibly just have a poor appetite and cannot get the food in that they need. It's easy just to put it straight through the peg. Important to remember is when someone has a peg placed, there's no need to stop eating. You can continue eating and just use the peg as and when you need to, or as much or as little as you need to. So I've shown you the picture on the left, I've shown you an actual physical copy of the peg tube. Um, but in the second uh, picture on the left hand side, there's the peg tube, what it would look like when somebody has it in the stomach. It's very comfortable tube, it's very flexible, so it's not going to be uncomfortable. You can stick it onto your skin to keep it out of the way, or you can just tuck it into your waistband, whatever you find easier. After about six months, once the tract into your stomach has healed and it's, it's all fine, there's a peg, that peg can be replaced for a much, a much uh, less obtrusive um, peg called a low profile one, which is the picture on the right hand side. And you can see it's, it's hardly noticeable there. Okay, so when thinking about a peg, it's important before making any decisions to find out as much as you can about 
what it what involves what it involves speak to people who are informed so your healthcare team read resources from reliable um, sources such as the MND Queensland or MND Australia website and together with that information then discuss with family and carers regarding your decision about a peg now it's important to remember with a peg that it needs to be placed before lung function is less than 50% or there is an anesthetic risk there. Um, if someone has it placed earlier, it does mean that the recovery is quicker and easier and definitely want to avoid lots of weight loss before putting a peg in. So um, those considerations are important to remember when thinking about a peg. And it's also important to know you can have a peg placed, but not use it for a while. It could just be flushed with water uh, and you care on eating and drinking as normal. Okay, so what are the advantages? Studies have shown that it helps to increase length of life. Um, peg feeds can improve all the nutrition your body needs, provide all the nutrition your body needs, or can be used up only what you eat daily, sorry used to top up on what you eat daily. Um, meal times, if they've been long, if they've been quite hard in the past because of, of some coughing or choking, they can be a lot less stressful. So, you know, flushing the feed through the peg just quickly will help people gain control again and also helps to maintain quality of life. Um, carers do find it easier to give nutrition and hydration via the peg if someone's not eating very well. And also to remember that the pig is very easy to care for. It just needs to be cleaned with warm water once or twice a day um, and kept dry on the skin to look after the skin around the pig. Pigs are unobtrusive, can be hidden under clothing, but also having a pig doesn't mean you have to stay at home and try to eat. It increases your independence and um, result can allow and continued participation at social gatherings. There are disadvantages of having a peg, so um, thinking about body image, um, is it acceptable to have a peg in your stomach? How do you feel about that? Um, there is risk of infection of the peg site, but if they're with good care every day, um, it's unlikely to happen. And there are some complications, rare complications, during or from placement of the peg. Okay, and that's something to speak more to your and nurse or um, GP about. I'm actually nearly at the end, so we nearly got to the end. Um, I just want you to say that there are actually two ways of um, giving feed via the peg. The first one is what we call bolus peg feeds. So this is where a bottle of feed, such as the one that's there, will be put into a jug, you draw it out into a syringe, and then syringe it in through the peg. And that mm -hmm. could take anything from two minutes to 10 minutes. It's really depending, dependent on the person. We would always say flush with water before and after. So it's a very convenient way of having food. Another way that it could be given is through a litre or a 500 ml bag of feed, such as the one on the left. Uh, this is hung up above the person's head and is allowed to either drip feed through into the peg or there is a pump which will pump it through. So it, it just depends um, if someone is feeling nauseous and just cannot manage a big bolus of feed, that's when we tend to give the gravity feeds. And this could last from half an hour to two or three hours. It, it really, it's really variable. Okay, um, I just want to say this, there is some recommended reading here if you're wanting to find out a bit more information. Um, the first one, you, the Nemo site I was talking about before is Nutritional Educational Materials Online. They give lots of information about high protein, high energy diet, texture modification, nausea, constipation and eating for those things. The MND Australia site has information about the gastrostomy and eating and drinking promote neurone disease as well is the MD Association, which actually is a UK site. So all very good and interesting reading there as well. Okay. So just to really sum up, in MD, maintaining a good diet intake has the individual challenges, but these will change over time. So just want to say keep in touch with your dietitian uh, who will support and help you to meet these challenges. 
And that's me. Thank you very much for listening. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Pleasure. Get everyone back then. Excellent. So um, I think some of you are still muted, but now is an excellent opportunity to ask um, Valerie any questions that anyone has. So does anyone want to ask anything? I find that if I try to use undiluted resource too, I feel nauseous now. I don't know whether it's dumping or something like that. So I have to dilute it down to about a third concentration. Mm -hmm. And are you managing to have the right amount of resource every day still? Oh, yes, yes. I mean, the volume is not a problem. It's, um, I mean, part of the problem with the resource for me is. I dislike vanilla. Ah, oh, right. Are you drinking it or putting no, it? No, no, it's going through the fish shops to me. Okay. But still the smell. Yes, yes. Um, there are different flavours of resource as well. So I don't know if you've tried any of those. Well, I've tried the chocolate. I mean, you would think that Nestle could make a decent chocolate flavoured milk, <laughs> but the resource chocolate is worse than the vanilla. Oh, okay, okay. I would I would speak with your dietitian and see if you could find a different supplement possibly or a flavor. I, I use that so-called um, neutral one when I'm using the stuff with fiber. So that's less than a vanilla. Oh yeah. Is that better? Do you tolerate yeah. that better? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, the, um, the resource too is, is very concentrated as well, so you may find that's, that's the reason why you need to dilute it a bit. But, um, I noticed on your, your diagram you had somebody syringing, I would, be, I would find using a syringe with a plunger impossible. Yes. So I just use a syringe and pour it into the syringe with a small jug. Yes, yes. That's something actually is a very good point. It's a very good point. You can um, give it that way as well and let it just run in by itself rather than plunging it. Okay, is there any other questions? Oh, good. Um, I did want to ask Valerie about um, cost of the various different supplements and funding available. Are you able to talk to that at all? Yes, yes I am. So, uh, Queens, as this is Queensland, I'll speak about Queensland Health. Um, firstly, we, you can get a script from Queensland Health through a dietitian to um, supply the feeds. Now, the cost can vary if, if someone is going on the HENS program. At this moment in time, it's about $37.11 every week. And uh, with that, they can get their uh, feed, um, syringes, uh, giving sets, anything that they, any equipment that they need for their um, pig feed. Um, and it's just a set cost. It could be slightly less than that if you use a different program where someone only needs two or three, sorry, one or two uh, drinks every day. So, but that cost is, is variable. It'll be less than $37 a week, but it depends on the supplement mm -hmm. and where you get the supplements from mm -hmm. as to the cost. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, um, obviously those people that have funding for the NDIS can use that to pay for it and if you're on my age care you can get a supplement an addition yeah. and more than more than covers the cost yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay. that's right and um, with my age care the supplement is is very good um, but you've got to remember that you can compare you've got to balance it up with what you can get from Queensland Health through the hens program and find the best deal there um, 
I haven't looked a lot into it, but in the past when I've looked at the supplement, to get the same value for money as you would from Queens and Health, you'd have to buy quite big volumes of the feed or the syringes or whatever the equipment is that you needed, and then it would definitely pay off. Um, and of course, the NDIS would, would cover the cost of your nutrition as and sup syringes as well. You would just need to include um, the cost of an NDIS dietitian in your plan to, to be able to advise on, on the feed and, and diet too. Okay, thank you for that. Any last questions before we wrap up? No, I'm good. Okay. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming to join us today. And thank you particularly to Valerie for your time. Um, what we were saying when you went up, um, when we lost you for a, a bit, that was really useful in terms of some really practical tips around um, main, avoiding weight loss, as well as um, some really informative information about pegs and, and what you need to do to mm. make that decision. So thanks again for, for your time. It's great to see everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and um, hopefully we'll see you all in the future. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.